Hello, it's Joe Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast. Today I'm interviewing Quill and Ink from Quill and Ink History. Uh, thank you for coming on today. Um, so how did you first get interested in history? Uh, I was actually interested in, in philosophy mainly for, uh, first, and I mainly became interested. I have always had this like sub interest in history uh, when I was younger. It usually started with like military history, and then I became interested in more like cultural history. And like now, I mainly focus on history of science and the history of science and religion, like the historical relationship, in um, with the main focus on with the main focus on like the pre modern, uh, ancient, and medieval science. And I think it really started with. Um, Let's see. Last uh, autumn, two thousand sixteen, and I remember watching a YouTuber. He's very big uh, right now. He's called History Buffs. You might have heard of him. I don't think so. No. Okay, I remember he was doing a history because he's a guy that basically does uh, historical reviews of like historical movie reviews, where he like checks out movies and uh, see watch likes. Okay, which part uh, is accurate, historical accurate? What part is not historical accurate? And he was doing a review of the movie Agora from 2009, which is a movie about the philosopher Hypatia of Alexandria uh, in, um, I think, like late uh, 300s, early 400s, who was, uh, I think, murdered by Bishop Cyril and a mob in a like political in the political turmoil. And I remember watching. He was very polemical at the end of the video, and he made several claims that didn't make much sense to me because I was uh, on on medieval history and I remember thinking to myself okay this doesn't make much sense and um, I thought I'll just do some research to like double check what the claims he made and uh, let's just say that the more I read on the su different subjects and the more claims he made uh, the more false I found and we're not talking small false we're talking like he's getting like scholarly consensus wrong and like the general history wrong. So I think that's really what started it. Cause I think remember like one somewhere in that process of like reading, I remember was late reading like Ronald Numbers and David Lindbergh. Uh, I came over like Edward Grant um, and a few others. And then I thought to myself, why don't I make a video about this? And so I started like thinking about this concept of like science and religion from like an historical perspective. And there's no one really doing it on YouTube, as I understand at the moment. So I thought, why don't I do it? Because it's it's a niche that I can like make my own own and I can like reach out to people and stuff. So that's really how I started um, in January this year. Interesting. So in in this topic of dealing with misconceptions about Christianity's relationship to science and the mis the, the mistaken view of the scholarly consensus, mm -hmm. um, what what led you to decide on the topics that you actually covered first? So how did you? There's so much to tackle. Uh, what what sort of rubric did you mm -hmm. use to to start and focus in on first? Yeah, I think I started with um, it started because I was reading about ancient science because I was like reading about the claims that Histrobus had made in his Agora review. So that was the way I started into. Um, so like the the early church relationship to the like Greek philosophical traditions and the tradition like like Plato and Aristotle and the others. And I remember getting my hands on a book called that you may have heard of. It's called Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths About Science and Religion, and it's essentially an anthology over very common misconceptions done by the American scholar Ronald Numbers, where he essentially gathered uh, 25 very distinguished scholars like David Lindbergh, uh, Peter Harrison, John Hedley Brooke, Brooke, uh, Catherine Park, Morris Fanacario, and a lot of others. And he, he, more, and he lets them, every scholar, write a short essay on it, on a very common misconception about usually about science and religion. And to give them a few examples, we have uh, that the rise of Christianity was responsible for the demise of ancient science. That's myth one. Myth two, that the medieval church suppressed the growth of science. Uh, myth five, that the medieval church prohibited human dissection. And myth number 25, uh, this is a very interesting one, that modern science has secularized Western culture by John Hedley Brook. So that, that kind of ontology really gave me a, how to say it, it opened the door to new subjects. And 
So that's kind of how I started going into like different subjects like uh, the myth of the flat earth uh, during the Middle Ages and so on. But other than that, I think it's been a bit of like, I found found this currently interesting at the time, like the Inquisition, or I found this other subject interesting at the time. So that is, I think, most of the reason I made the videos, focused on the topics I'm, I have focused at at the moment. I was trying to make a video on the Galileo affair, but um, I found that this subject was uh, too complex to really make like a 10 minute video on. So I remember I laid the work on ice and it's still on ice at the moment. Okay. Um, one, one topic that's been a particular bugbear for me, and you might consider doing a video on it, hmm. is the idea that the Christians burned down the Library of Alexandria. In fact, oh, I think that's, that's a common one. That, that, that's part of the, uh, the story in the movie Agora, which is, again, just patently absurd. I think one of the most um, deleterious works done by Carl Sagan was his his little brief segment on Cosmos where he goes into the history of science. <laughs> yes, and uh, and it's just a complete train wreck. Um, maybe you could explain some of the missteps that he makes there. Yeah, Carl Sagan unfortunately has, um, I think, I, I'm not familiar with his science, but I assume it's he's a good scientist. And when it comes to history, he's that kind of uh, goodness doesn't carry over. He generally... I'm not sure. It was made in the 1980s, so I'm not sure exactly how much scholarship that we have today was uh, he had back then. But I know from Second of Cosmos, he makes so many claims that just is his own opinions that he adds in because they're convenient. To give an example, he, for example, in his very dark voice, he says, Slavery, the cancer of the ancient world, had sapped out the vitality of the Roman Empire. Which doesn't make much sense because slavery had always been like the base... Uh, base of the economy for like both Athens and Rome for centuries but so it just made an opinion but okay let's start from the beginning uh, the Christians burnt down the library of Alexandria in 1415 uh, the biggest problem with this claim is that the library of Alexandria most likely did not exist in 1415 it has ceased to exist uh, either by b the burning of Julius Caesar or or an, or by like it had been a like a gradual uh, denigration like it's the city's been plundered and been under, under siege several times and through those sieges like um the library had deteriorated deteriorated which is one that an explanation that i personally find more convincing that the idea than the idea that yuli caesar burned it down but that's kind of the main point the library of alexandria did not exist in 1415. okay secondly um I don't know. Can you fill me in, Todd? What other claims does Sagan make? Well, Sagan makes the uh, very silly claim that pr prior to Christianity, the Library of Alexandria was kind of like the pagan version of the National Academy of Sciences, almost. Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> it's covering like, uh, five, like what's it, what does it make? Like 500,000 to a million scrolls or like these ludicrous claims that modern writers like to throw around uh, like it's yeah. the size of the library of Alexandria is often overestimated and here's the thing there are ancient sources that makes these claims like we have 200,000 to 500,000 I think the biggest ones are it's like 700,000 we have two authors writing that uh, here's the thing though we also have authors both Leif and early who makes the claim that the library of Alexandria contained like 50,000 or like 40,000. I don't have the numbers in, I know the historian Tim O'Neill has a very good blog article on the subject, but the main claim, the main reason is that, okay, the main point is that we actually don't know exactly how big it was because none of these are reliable uh, accounts can be said to be reliable. And I remember O'Neill uh, related to an article done by a scholar and historian called Dana Delia, and she pointed out that you know these sort of claims they must be taken with a big grain of salt because the ancient uh, ancient like librarians did not have the modern inventory system that we have have so they would have impossible uh, to know about uh, how much how many scrolls they had even if they like had had wanted to uh, I think Sagan also makes the claim that you know um, or let, let's forget about that um, okay so. The Library of Alexandria, it was not as big as, it, as, as people claim, as 
he wants to proclaim it is. It was not burnt down by Christian because he had ceased to exist by that point. Let's see what other claims does he make. Um, I think he also makes a lot of claim about scholars working there, like Pythagoras, Aristarchus, and a few others. And outside, I know Eratosthenes. I'm like I'm referring to uh, Timoneo's article here. I'm actually not that um, good. I'm oh, sorry, I lost myself. Um, I know outside Eratosthenes. Um, let's see, my screen just went black. Um, outside. Do you hear me? Um, Sorry, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, um, okay, I lost myself again. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, that's all right. Um, well, one of the things uh, that's sort of related is uh, this idea that I think it was one of the videos you put up where Ronald Numbers talks about the fact that natural sciences really just weren't popular anywhere. It wasn't like the pagans were for it, the Christians were against it. It was generally not seen as important in at least the way we would view it today in the 21st century. So maybe you could explain that a little bit. Uh, I think an important question must ask is why did people want to study about natural philosophy? Why did people want to learn about nature? Because sci natural philosophy or science as we call it today did not have the same like practical value that it has today. You know, science today, like we make discoveries in medicine and we cure people when we have cars that, and our lives like, Technology is very close to science, science, which means that like, achievements in one field is going to affect the other field. But that was not the case in the ancient and medieval world. In the ancient world, science was generally detached from technology and therefore was well practically useless. Useless because you couldn't, because there was almost no way to apply it in society. With the exception of like medicine and a bit of astronomy, was which was mainly useful because it was related to astrology. So the reason that people, that ancient philosopher like Plato and Aristotle studied natural philosophy, like in astronomy and motion and stuff, was because they wanted to she, they wanted to be able to tell them other questions. For example, like for Plato, the question was like, uh, wh how can I be good? What is goodness? For Aristotle, the question was more like, well, what's my purpose in the universe? You know, was what's the purpose of this thing? For Epicurus, the question was more like, well, what is happiness and how can I achieve it? And the philosophers, these philosophers uh, essentially saw natural philosophy uh, as kind of handmaidens to be able to achieve, to answer these questions. And like their natural philosophy was byproducts of trying to answer those questions. So while the, maybe the Greek, early Greek philosophers uh, in the like, during the Hellenistic period, had a very high view on natural philosophy. Uh, that interest had was declining during the Roman. By the time the Romans had come along and conquered the Mediterranean, because the Romans were not very interested in science in the kind of like the classical science and classical learning. Learning. I know Roman. The Roman Empire was mainly was not. Uh, populated by philosophers and scientists, but rather by popularizers and you know uh, handbooks, people who made handbooks. So classical science, the classical learning was in decline, even before the kind of like the Christians went, came on the scene in the like the late uh, in the three hundreds and in the like fourth century and fifth century. So even if the Christians had been like anti anti you know, philosophy and opposed to like the Greek philo Greek philosophy and Greek si ancient science and ancient philosophy, uh, it wouldn't have mattered much because ancient philosophy and ancient science was already in decline at that point. So that's part of the problem with like the sort of that uh, idea that the early Christians like caused the demise of ancient science and therefore delayed the space age <laughs> as some <laughs> history. Yes. Well, yeah. The Another thing is um, the idea that Alexandria ceased to be a center of learning after it was allegedly destroyed in 415 is, of course, also laughable. Uh, one of the, uh, I think you mentioned him in one of your videos, the great natural philosopher John Philoponus, who was also mm -hmm. known as the uh, father of the Kalam cosmological argument, he did some interesting breakthroughs in uh, natural philosophy. Maybe you could explain some of his contributions. 
Uh, I'm not uh, super familiar with uh, with John Falafinus, uh, but I know one of the things he made is he challenged a lot of the Aristotelian consensus at the time. Time, for example, he argued that the universe was not eternal, uh, and he argued also against the. I think more important, he argued against the fifth celestial element, element which was a big breakthrough with the Aristotelian uh, kind of natural philosophy and cosmology. More than that, I'm af I don't know. No, I'm afraid. One of the things that's interesting about John is that he performed a thousand years before Galileo the very experiments to prove that the mass, the weight of an object doesn't matter in calculating the velocity which it falls. Oh, yeah, yes, he did that too, I, I remember. And, and largely the reason why he was forgotten is due to the fact that he was on the wrong side of a theological dispute. I think he was a monothelite or something. And he got sort of written out of the history books, this time not by the atheists, but by, unfortunately, fellow Christians. Um, but you, uh, one of the things is, as far as the, uh, the alleged war of uh, religion and science is uh, in, in Western Christendom, you know, the myth of the Dark Ages, a uh, common, common thing that's thrown around is, uh, you know, the atheists will say, well, the Christians caused the Western Dark Ages. And there's that little graph of the, the gap. And oh, the yes, yes, yes. So why, why, don't you, why don't you debunk for us a little bit some of this whole Dark Age nonsense? Okay. And I, I love the graph thing because it's like, I have seen it for like three years now, and I still have no clue what it's supposed to measure, really. I'm not sure, are you talking about methodology, theories, like math, I, I don't know. Okay, so let's start with the idea of the Dark Ages in Western Europe. Uh, I maybe could, ex um, I know David Lindbergh in his uh, book, The Beginnings of Western Science, Science, which is a kind of a textbook in the history of like sci ancient and medieval science. When he gets over to talk about the medieval uh, the scientific development in the medieval era, he starts by saying that, you know, this is a common term known as the Dark Ages for the medieval era, and it's universally rejected by scholarship today. It's not used anymore. So, okay, so the Dark Ages, uh, the Middle Ages, what do we have? Uh, you could say that kind of there was a Dark Ages uh, after the, in Western Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire, because a lot of kind of like the Greek uh, literature uh, fell into, like, uh, couldn't be read anymore because very few people in, the in like, the post-Roman um, uh, Western Europe couldn't read Greek. They either read, if they could read at all, they read Latin or, like, some indigenous language. language. And that kind of, what we, um, okay. And that kind of continues until, like, the 18 1800s when, was it called, uh, Charlemagne, uh, Charlemagne unites Europe for a while, and he starts setting up cathedral schools, schools, and kind of gathering the knowledge he had about uh, about the ancient philosophers, and that continues um, into kind of like after the Charlemagne's empires disintegrate into what's called the, I think it's called the 12th century Renaissance. So as we see a flourishing in in like classical and ancient learning during the Middle Ages, and to give some. Some examples. First, we have the rise of the university, which is a completely new invention, like a corporation and an institution that's mainly focused towards learning, learning, learning about arts, learning about theology, learning about math, uh, logic, and so forth. We also see uh, what's called uh, what's called the translation movement, which is that during the eleven. 1100s, like late 1100s, early 1200s, uh, the Western European intellectuals, intellectuals realized that they had some knowledge about ancient, about ancient thinkers, but there was still more to discover, discover. And they realized that that knowledge was to be found in Byzantium or the Islamic world, world. And so what they did was that they went out to like uh, Constantinople, and I think especially Spanish Islamic Spain and. Um, was called, uh, and start, they started to uh, search for these uh, manuscripts of Aristotle, of Plato, I think mostly Aristotle, Aristotle and um, they started copying and, and translating them into Latin and kind of like transferring them back to medieval Europe. And I think this might not seem as a big thing, but it's really big because how often do you really have like a civilization that realizes that other people knew, uh, know more than us? And we should find out what they, and we should find out what they know that we don't know, like and learn from them. Most civilizations usually start from the assumption that, like, we know what's like, we have the truth, we know what's real. 
real and like there's nothing to learn from others. Okay. So those are two things. And lastly, and this might seem very strange for like the Middle Ages, I remember Edward Grant points towards it. It's the kind of the a more emphasis on reason than before. Before, and you can see it in places like uh, with new Christian apologetics, like you know, Anselm's um, ontological argument for the existence of God. Um, I think you know Thomas Aquinas, not five ways, but like his uh, method deal with questions and so on. I'm not really, can't really go into much detail, but that are some of the things that you start seeing in the during the. Middle Ages, and then there's the idea that okay, well, there might be some like scientific achievement or philosophical achievement, but uh, the medieval church, medieval church suppressed it probably because you know everything associated with paganism was bad and so forth. Uh, and there really is not that much science of conflict between Christianity and um, and the pagan philosophy, the and like natural philosophy and science during the Middle Ages. There is one. There's one incident of like a real conflict, and that is known during the 1200s, because um, much philosophy, the Christian, like me, the medieval Christians, did not have much problem. Oh, screen went black. Um, the medieval Christians yeah. did not have um, problem with much of like Plato, philo Plato's philosophy, but when it came to Aristotle's philosophy. They certain questions start to arise because Aristotle has certain metaphysical presuppositions and kind of philosophical presuppositions that did not correspond well with Christianity. Christianity and those mainly concerns like ideas of the soul, um, the soul, the eternity of the, the idea of that the universe is eternal, and certain ideas that infringes upon God's almightiness, uh, the idea of God's almightiness. So. This kind of tension started ar arising in 1215, where the, at the University of Paris, most of this is focused at the University of Paris. The other universities like Oxford and Bologna, and uh, like those in Germany, were not affected, were not as much affected by this. But it started with the 1215 in the University of Paris, where the local bishop uh, kind of made a legis legislation or something similar, and that forbid the using of Aristotle's uh, works as lecture material. Material. Uh, that ban was kind of like, ban on Aristotle as lecture material was then removed, later removed, but it was followed up in 1277 with a condemnation uh, from the Vatican. And it's kind of, they call it's called the condemnation <clears throat> of 1277. And it's essentially like around 250, condemnation of 250 position or thesis that was not allowed to be defended in at the universities and most of these can be like um, reduced to three kind of categories first what had to do with the eternity of the universe questions like is the universe eternal uh, you were not allowed to argue for that that or like is time eternal uh, that was also very controversial controversial and others had to do with and these are very interesting they had to do with god and um, god's omnipotence and what he could do and not do with the universe um so the and, and then there was a third category that which was claims that was pretty relevant to natural philosophy i don't want the combination was like no one it was uh, it was like uh, no man gets smart of studying theology <laughs> theology which is sort of odd but then there was like uh, the eternity of the universe and God's almightiness. And one question that was very tension, like uh, on the t topic in like tension, um, what's it called? There was a lot of tension around, was the question, could there be other worlds other than our own? And in the Aristotelian cosmology and natural philosophy, uh, the earth is, a, the universe is a sphere with like, you have the celestial uh, sphere, which is like the heavens, and then you have the earth, earth like the sublunar sphere where you have the elements. I don't know if you're familiar with like Aristotle's idea of the four elements, Todd? Uh, not so much. Okay, but I can of idea. And beyond the sphere, nothing could exist. Like no matter, no space, no, no nothing. And so in Aristotelian universe, there could not be other worlds. There was no possibility for other worlds. However, in a Christian universe, 
in a Christian world, of course it could be other worlds, because God had created this world, and it could create other worlds besides it. Besides it. So then the question started to arise, well, okay, if there is two worlds that are uh, that exist uh, besides one another, there have to be void space between them. Between them. Okay, and if there's void space between them, then there has to exist something something outside Aristotle, like the sphere of the universe. Universe, and what you start seeing in in the kind of the during the 1200s and the 1300s are kind of two kind of response uh, reactions to this to the condemnations. Since one is the um, is the kind of lessening degree in certainty about claims about nature, because a lot of like hypothetical scenarios will start to go to go into the like the discussions about natural philosophy philosophy um, and it's also uh, very interesting is that because these sort of hypothetical scenarios started to arising people started asking questions and going beyond uh, kind of the Aristotelian framework they did not abandon Aristotle but they started to go against not go against but like go around Aristotle on certain points points, questions like, for example, I, you know, like Nicholas, the uh, 1400, uh, and 14th century philosopher, natural philosopher, and Bishop Nicholas Resmi, like, broke with Aristotle uh, on one point where it said, like, there is a void space outside the universe because, you know, God is omnipresent and therefore he has to be everywhere in even, like, outside the universe. Universe, mm -hmm. and um, so... Okay, I I think I ram have rambled a lot now, okay, but and try to summarize, to summarize kind of Christianity and and um, science during the Middle Ages was uh, the Middle Ages was not a dark ages. It was uh, actually a new emphasis on reason during the High Middle Ages, High Middle Ages, which can be seen in several areas, with like the university the translation movement, movement, um, like a new kind of Christian apologetics upswing during the 1100s and there was very few instances of a conf of a conflict between the like um ancient the ancient philosophers and uh, christianity and where there were tensions were more on the questions were more very abstract metaphysical questions rather than the kind of like traditional stereotypical like well christianity give one explanation of what the universe looks like science give another explanation and they have to compete with each other each other this is there is no instance of like i think there may be one with like maps i read some i read in a book by charles uh, robert bartlett but other than that there's no real like stereotypical like conflict between science and religion, uh, and science and Christianity during the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. One other contributor to the Dark Ages was, of course, the collapse of the central Roman authority and the Germanic barbarian invasions. Um, one thing that is interesting to note is that the Carolingian Renaissance was largely the result of scholarship from Ireland and Northumbria, and uh, it's unfortunate that the center of learning in the north was Lindisfarne, was the, the first major target of Viking raids. <laughs> and um, Ireland itself, which uh, and Northumbria, were both uh, essentially looted into oblivion by the Norsemen. So any sort of independent Western scholarship was put on a serious hold until uh, really the high Middle Ages with the uh, influx from uh, Muslim Spain. Another thing that's interesting is, I don't know if you've seen the YouTube channel, Real Crusades History, but he did do a, some like six, seven part review on the Kingdom of Heaven film. Going oh, through I love the, that review. Yeah, it's good. He points out that for the first time in Western Europe during the Crusades, uh, the, the wheelbarrow was invented and that uh, the population was able to grow enough food to escape essentially the Malthusian trap where people could finally uh, develop physically without having stunted growth due to lack of nutrition. Um, yes. And that's that's huge. I mean, people don't take that into consideration. And it's it's also very interesting, too, that the uh, the first university of Bologna in 1088 was founded more or less after – the Northmen uh, had been converted to Christianity. The Magyars had been converted to Christianity, and the Reconquista had pushed the Moors far enough away from Spain that the heart of Europe 
Germany, the Low Countries, it, Northern Italy, France, and England were safe from repeated invasion. Once once they had that buffer zone, they then ultimately were able to develop uh, their own in, indigenous uh, academic institutions. Um, but one thing as well, I've noticed some of your videos are about the Inquisition, both the medieval and the Spanish. Um, yes. And there seems to be various misconceptions about the Inquisition. So why don't we why don't we discuss that for a little bit? Yeah, I think the Inquisition is probably one of the most demonized institutions, like in the history of Christendom, or at least in the like medieval and Renaissance and like new modern history. And so you must start with the question: What is the Inquisition? Uh, what are we talking about when we say the medieval Inquisition, like the Spanish Inquisition or the Italian Inquisition? So. Uh, the Inquisition really starts with, or like inquisitors, really spring up in the early uh, 13th century uh, Europe. Uh, we have like kind of a new increased orthodoxy, doxy, which uh, it was too long. I, I read it's it's from a book called The Formation of Persecution Society by the scholar R. M. Moore, which was too long since I read it, so I can't recount it as much. But the inquisitors you start seeing is kind of like their judges. There's some sort of like detectives and their judges at the same time. Time and their purpose was more or less to root out the kind of new heretical uh, heretical movements, such as the Kafars and the new religious movements, such as the Valdensian and the Benduins. Benduins and the way they did this was that the Pope like uh, ordered them to go to a place where uh, there was suspicion of heresy and uh, the medieval inquisitor then went out to the place and started to like say that he was going to uh, root out heretics at like the local town or local village and um, what's it called and what the basic did then was he ordered people to and what he ordered people to come to what's it called interrogations with people and to kind of root out, get new information about theoretical networks. And they usually did not only want information about, like, are you a heretic? Like, are you not, are you, do you diverse from like the Catholic doctrine, a uh, Catholic doctrine, but also like, do you know anyone who's like, who go, who holds beliefs that's contradict to like the Catholic doctrine, doctrine and that way they could they were very effective in comparison to early like i guess you can call it inquisitorial system that was done by like local bishops and kings kings in that they could route root out whole like family networks of like dozens of people people and uh, then when they have done that done that they usually ask the person like if they wanted to convert convert or like or if and if they did not, uh, they were going to receive a very heavy, hard punishment, which can be like life imprisonment, or in worst case, being handed over to the secular authorities, which more or less meant that they were going, going to be executed, because the secular authorities was much more harsher towards heretics than the ecclesiastical authorities. Authorities, and I think one of the common misconceptions about the medieval Inquisition was first that it was a thing, because there was no. Uh, during at least during the Middle Ages, there was no uh, organization called in, in the Inquisition. What you have is individual inquisitors who answer directly to the papacy, see, and who seldom work together with other inquisitors. And the second and the kind of the more common ones is first the inquisitors you uh, use torture a lot and like were real sadists, often portrayed as sadists and like Monty Python and other. And other popular media, yeah, who tortured people. And as a thing, uh, the inquisitors rarely had to use torture. First, because they usually could get enough information for to be able to make a verdict based on their interrogations. And secondly, because is the thing you're probably aware that uh, if I subject someone to torture, I can make them confess to almost anything. Mm -hmm. And this was well known by the medieval and like the Italian and Spanish inquisitors too. So when they were about to uh, to apply some of the torture, because they need there was they thought it was going to be going to be like a they needed a what's called a confession of some sort. Uh, they subjected the person to torture, and the subject was did not only have to confess during torture, 
but also during several hours later when not being subject to torture, only to make the confession valid. And when you look at kind of the way they use torture and compared to like the secular authorities, like the kings and lords and barons, barons is that they are much more lenient and much more restricted in what they can do and what they can't do. Like if you see something like, you know, old 1930s you know, depictions of the Inquisition, Inquisition, they have like these sort of Iron Maidens, these sort of big statues where they put people in and like uh, spike them with, you know, spears and stuff. And they put them, you know, they break their legs, they burn their feet and all sort of horrible things. And none of this was things that the Inquisitors were allowed to do because when it came to torture, the medieval Inquisitors, I remember both like all these scholars are like whether it's the Edward Peters or Jennifer Dean uh, points out that the inquisitors were first, they were not allowed to cause permanent injuries to the subject suspect. And there also needed to be a medical expert uh, close um, uh, there when during the interrogations in case the inquisitor would go too far, far. So the inquisitors rarely used torture and when they did, it was very restricted and did not cause any permanent injuries. And then, of course, the last, I think the most common myth is that the Inquisitors killed many people. People, you know. And this is special, like the Spanish Inquisition. Is the Spanish Inquisition is known for. And this simply is not true. I don't know, have any like total numbers for the convicted people who were uh, killed by the medieval Inquis Inquisition, but most numbers by the medieval Inquis inquisitors for the people who were convicted. Uh, most In most accounts of people who were convicted by inquisitors, the amounts executed or put to, put to the torch were lower than 5%. And I think, and this was true for essentially all the inquisitions, whether it's the medieval, the Spanish or the Italian inquisition. inquisition and uh, the reason is because, and I think people have to understand that the Inquisition, though I'm not a fan of it, uh, you have to, I'm not a fan of it, definitely, but you have to remember that its purpose was not to kill people or to hurt people, but to convert them. So in order, and I remember Jennifer Dean points this out, that to, to hand over someone to the secular authorities, because the Inquisitors technically didn't kill anyone, they just handed them over to other people to do the dirty work, uh, which, though it counts as killing because, you know, they know that the person was going to be executed. Um, they, when they did that, it was seen as a failure by the Inquisitor because uh, the soul of the person were not was not saved. There was also the problem with that if they executed someone, there was always the fear that that person would become a, what's it called, a martyr, uh, like a heretic martyr in their own community. Which made it something, which made it something that, which made like execution something that they wanted to avoid. And usually, when it came to like make people convert, um, I think Jennifer Dean points is that uh, threats of execution was actually not not as effective as effectful as other threats, such as like life imprisonment or I think life imprisonment was a common was a common like threat that most people bench to and confess or like and com converted. So, okay, to try to sum up, I, I'm rambling here, of course, uh, and try to sum up uh, the Inquisition, they was very, it was a very small thing. Like it wasn't a thing during the Middle Ages, the kind of Spanish and Italian, the regional Inquisition started preparing during the uh, late 1400s and continues until the 1800s. And they had very low power in the in their respective societies and the medieval inquisition was not an organization itself they rarely used torture and when it did it was very restricted and they killed very few people yeah you know one of uh, a former uh friend of mine he uh, he mentioned that uh, in spain during the spanish inquisition people would often uh commit acts of uh, sacrilege to be tried by the Inquisition rather than the secular authorities because they were confident they'd get a fair hearing by the religious authorities because they would be also tried for the secular crime as well as the, uh, the ecclesiastical crime. And yeah. the, other, the other thing that's interesting too is the historian um, 
one of the leading historians of the, of the Inquisition named Henry uh, Common. Henry Common, yeah. He says that the Spanish Inquisition, which was in operation for over 300 years, only executed maybe 2,000 people. I think 3,000 to 5,000 is the most common numbers. Mm -hmm. But even if we take, say, a more liberal number like 5,000, compare that to the repression and terror of atheist states like, say, the Soviet Union. In fact, during the 1930s when Stalin yeah, was, yeah, building, was building the... Uh, the canal between the uh, Karelian Isthmus, a uh, hundred thousand people died building that canal. Yeah, That's you know, Todd, I actually have an even better comparison uh, with the Spanish Inquisition. If you want to be a more fairer, you can guess say, if the Spanish Inquisition maybe killed three thousand to five thousand people during this course of a span of uh, three hundred fifty years, Robespierre killed over sixteen thousand people in thirteen months. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it, there really is no compare, without, of course, justifying the Inquisition. The idea that somehow religious violence is is either uh, unique in degree or extent, more so than quote unquote secular violence. It's just laughable. Secular violence is many many orders of magnitude more than we're killed by religious violence, but also in a much more compressed period of time. It's the time compression that I think is so important and people miss. If you just compare the numbers, that's bad enough. But the religious persecution takes place over centuries, whereas with the um, secular persecution it takes place in months and years, which I think many people tend to uh, not appreciate. Um, one thing that I think would be an interesting era, area for possible for historical revision and I don't know very many people that have dealt with this. But in the United States, there's a lot of uh, liberal uh, propaganda about the Puritans, the early settlement of the 13 colonies, the witch trials in Salem, the treatment of the Indians at uh, the first Thanksgiving in the Plymouth settlement. And I wonder if you know of any recent scholarship that gives a more accurate account of the initial English settlers' contact with the indigenous population. I'm sorry, that's a subject I have no knowledge in, so I can't make a comment on it. I, it sounds like a good topic to make a video about in the future, but I can't make any claim. That's my sub, my knowledge of that of that area is essentially zero. Yeah, I don't really. There's been a lot of helpful revision about the Middle Ages, about the Catholic Church. But there doesn't seem to have been a, a corresponding amount of revision, unless it's happening very recently, and I'm just not aware of it, of the Puritans, both in England proper uh, and in the and in the New England. Because in many ways, they seem to suffer from a similar bad reputation uh, as the Catholic Church did in the uh, popular consciousness. And I feel like that that's sort of the next logical step in this process of revision. Uh, yeah. You, uh, I'm actually this the kind of like early English set settlement in America is actually a, a topic I'm generally unfamiliar with. So could you fill me in like what are some of the claims that goes around about the kind of Puritan oh, yes. settlers and well the general the general con claim made by the the liberal left is that all the European settlers committed a you know an extensive genocide against the indigenous population, but within the U.S. context, it's the uh, the Puritans and the English. And the pilgrims, you know, we're guilty of. It's it's always one sided. We the, the settlers and the English were always the one that broke the treaties. They were always the one that initiated the aggression. Um, and from the very beginning, they were just bent on exterminating and conquering the uh, population. I have seen similar narratives about the conquistadors, and uh, that was the ones about the conquistadors are largely fictitious. There was a great book called Myths of Conquest. About the Spanish by Matthew Restall, Seven Myths of the Spanish Conquest, where he goes through and just debunks all of these. One, the central myth he debunks is the genocide of the indigenous population. And I feel like that some sort of treatment like Restall's for the Puritans is long overdue. Um, and I just wondered if, since your your speciality was uh, historical revision from a religious perspective. That would be something that would be very interesting to see done. Um, I'm certainly not competent to do that at the moment, but um, 
Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. It's it's not really a subject I've given much thought about uh, since I'm not familiar with it. You know, um, actually, if you speak about like a tr bad treatment of indigenous people, uh, you know, I'm Scandinavian. Right? Well, no, I did not. You know, because um, here in Scandinavia, we actually have people in kind of northern. Because Scandinavia is like northern Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, and in northern. I think mostly Sweden and Norway, we actually have indigenous Indian peoples who has been suppressed by kind of the central authorities uh, for, I think, a long time, and we still have problems with it today. You mean the Sami people? Oh, yeah, you know about the Sami people? Oh, yeah, man. They're the reindeer herders, right, up in the north? Yeah, they're mm -hmm. reindeers, they speak funny, uh, they eat fish and yeah, stuff like that. Uh, one other, I think maybe one also important uh, aspect of this. Well, why don't you explain how the, the myth that religion, Christianity in particular, and science have this millennia long feud? Okay, so, yeah, so shall I start from like the, how people start talking about it, uh, the conflict thesis, or shall I start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How was the conflict thesis developed and why think was it, it developed? I think really conflict thesis interestingly start with the Reformation. And I remember Peter Harrison speak a lot about this because during the Reformation, you have the kind of Protestant kind of denunciation of and demonization of the Catholic Church. And a lot of what they say, the Protestants back in the 1500s and 600s said about the Catholic Church was then picked up by Enlightenment thinkers and like 19th century historians and then attributed to Christianity and religion as a whole. For example, you get things like, um, I know Peter Harrison gave this very good example where before the Enlightenment you have Protestants saying things like, well, the Catholic Church caused the Dark Ages. And then you have people like Voltaire and Edward Gibbon saying that, nah, it was Christianity in general that caused the Dark Ages. So that's really where you have it, the kind of conflict thesis, the kind of foundation for it growing. And then, of, of course, builds up in, like, um, builds up by the Enlightenment philosophers and by 19th century uh, historians and thinkers. For example, August Comte, I think, uh, championed the idea. And so it's kind of in the, like, the flow among authors and writers, but it doesn't really get into academia there until the late 19th century by two authors, one known as Andrew Dixon White and the other is John William Draper. John William Draper in, I think, 1870 wrote a book called The History of the Conflict Between Science and Religion Within Christendom, which is basically a whole rant about the Catholic Church and that's all he talks about is the Catholic Church, like the Catholic Church calls the Dark Ages, the Catholic Church opposed human dissection, you know, the Catholic Church opposed science and all that. And then it was also done by Andrew Dixon White, uh, Andrew Dixon White, which also wrote a book that is very, was very influential. And it's kind of from there that really the sort of conflict thesis springs up and kind of gets a hold in academia. Yeah, academia. And it have had this hold until really the 1970s, when a new generation of scholars, such as Ronald Numbers, David Lindbergh, Edward Grant, John Hillebrook, and others, started to really dismiss it. It had been historians that had dismissed it, like um, that had critiqued it before, but really in the like 70s, especially the 80s, where it started to become rejected. And uh, I know actually a special quote from Ronald Numbers and David Lindbergh in a book called God and Nature, which is a history of, on the relationship between science and Christianity, where on page six they say something like, the interesting thing with the history of science and religion is that despite the fact that the war conflict thesis has been, is, rejected by the, is rejected by most scholars today, it refuses to die, die, like it refuses to get away somehow. And that's very interesting. And I think there's several reasons to why the conflict thesis is still um, still like prevalent in popular culture. I think the main reason is just lack of good like popular history. History. This sort of like if you read something like Carl Sagan or Cosmos by Neil deGrasse Tyson, you will get this sort of outdated pseudo history like rehashed and retold retold and it gets out in the like on the popular level level so i think just a, one of the that's the main reason is due to a lack of good uh, popular history 
history. Like, of course, the new atheists have contributed to this a lot as well. Well, but I think also, I remember at Peter Harrison, I think this more than this, but these are two one I want to focus on. First is kind of the lack of good uh, history of pop rising. But I think also this the issue that I know the scholar Peter Harrison has pointed out several times is that for certain worldviews and kind of discourses, this sort of conflict thesis fits very neatly as kind of a meta narrative narrative. Because the sort of you know the sort of issues that August Comte idea of the like three stages of history like first we had the religious states then we had the metaphysical state and now we have the scientific state, and the sort of issue of the conflict thesis fits very neatly in that idea because like, well the scientific state uh, had to, had to like compete with the religious state for explanation, and. Um, um, as well, and especially you can see this in like the works of the new atheists, like Richard Dawkins. For Richard Dawkins, this the conflict piece is essentially a creed. I mean, it's permanent in his book, and he knows nothing about history, as Peter Harrison points out. But he needs to believe that this sort of conflict piece in the sort of conflict pieces between science and Christianity and science and religion in general, in order to be able to say a lot of, uh, about what he says about the present. Present, you know, he needs a sort of meta narrative. In order to like make because it makes sense about a lot of things that he wants wants to be able to say today about science and religion. Yeah, you know, one other thing I think that was a contribution to the uh, conflict thesis, and then as a corollary to that, the uh, the historical uh, communities uh, relatively uh, ignorance of the Middle Ages and uninterested in it until recently is the Italian Renaissance thinkers, like people like Boccaccio. And people like Petrarch, which also kind of facilitated this this view that the classical world was was wonderful and progressive, and the medieval world was a, a step back. And you know, Gibbon, of course, uh, in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire, didn't do any favors to medieval scholarship as well. Um, and so this general prejudice is—I always got the impression it was kind of a Renaissance prejudice of the these secular humanists were styling themselves as latter-day Italian Renaissance humanists and that they had many of the same prejudices that uh, the 14th and 15th century Renaissance humanists had. Yeah, that's probably true. But um, we're about nearing the end of the, the allotted time. Is there anything you'd like to conclude with? Uh, can I give some um, um, like t uh, recommendations for further reading if there's anyone watching this or who has watched Oh yeah, watched definitely. So By all means. Uh, I think... Uh, Start by just recommending like articles that you can download and read for free. The first one is um, called "Beyond War and Peace: A Reprisal of the Encounter Between Christianity and Science" by David Lindberg and Ronald L. Numbers. It was published in 1987, um, seven, and at the Department of History of Science at um, the University of Wisconsin. And uh, it's essentially just a good overview and a good introduction to the kind of historical relationship between science and religion and Christianity. And it um, goes over things like, you know, uh, the ancient science and relationship to Christianity, Galileo, and the Middle Ages, Darwin. And so you can just Google it and you'll find it Beyond War and Peace, Ronald Numbers and David Lindberg. The other one is uh, Peter Harrison, uh, the scholar. He has, I really don't know why more why Christian apologists don't use this person a lot, because he has a lot of good material that I think Christian apologists would like. And he has a lot of good lectures on YouTube on like the rela historical relationship between science and Christianity. And he actually argues that uh, Christianity has played a decisive role in uh, as at certain parts in the development of modern science. So he has a Academia EDU page where he publishes all of the things that he has published that you can download on PDF. PDF and uh, so and I think there's one special um, a document called I think Science and Christian Church. Can can I send them to you and you can like so you can what's called put them in the show notes. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. I think Science and the Christian Church, and then it just like. Galileo goes to jail. Another myth about science and religion and uh, God and nature from 1986. That's also a very good book. And lastly, you probably know about it. God's Philosophers by James Hannum. It's probably the best popular introduction to medieval science and thinking that I know of. All right. 
Well, thank you for coming on. Uh, Colin Inc., this is Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast, signing off.